In this video, I want to update you on what I've been doing with JuggleBot's arm and what my current design is. If you are unsure of what this project is about and you want to have a good idea of what I'm up to, then I suggest checking out my previous video. So JuggleBot's arm has one objective and one objective only, and that is to move JuggleBot's hand into the correct position at the correct time in a highly repeatable manner. If it can't do this, then there's no hope for the hand being able to throw accurately and the whole thing's just going to fall apart. This needs to be very accurate and very repeatable. With this in mind, you might be thinking of those industrial robots that you've undoubtedly seen, and they seem to be the perfect fit for this job. They are fast, they are strong, they are highly repeatable, and that's why they're used in industry, but the problem is that I am not made of money and I don't really have a lot of space right now, so I can't really just get one of those. They're a little bit too cumbersome for what I'm doing. Uh, so I need an alternative. And to figure out what that alternative could be, we need to take a step back and have a think about how to move objects through space with robots. Now, the one way to do this is with a serial robot, which is what those industrial robots are. And those are named as such because each actuator is placed in series with those that precede it, much in the same way that our shoulder is linked up to our elbow, which is linked up to our wrist. And whatever movement I make at my shoulder will affect what my hand does, irrespective of what my wrist and elbow are doing. Now, these robots are great because they have an awesome range of motion. They can like fold up on themselves really well, but they have a problem, which is that because the, the actuators are stacked on top of one another, any slight error in each actuator has a tendency to compound so that if they are all a little bit off, then the end result will be a lot off. All of those errors will add up and everything will be massively off. The other type of robot that you can use to move something through space is called a parallel robot or a parallel manipulator. And these are structured by having all of the actuators attached to the same ground level or baseline, whatever you want to call it. These are great because it means that all of the force is distributed between the actuators. So each individual actuator doesn't need to be as strong as it would otherwise need to be, uh, for example, in a serial robot. And they're also good because it means that they don't face that same error issue that the serial robots encountered. To see this in action, you can imagine having a serial robot where there are, say, three actuators all stacked on top of one another, and they all expand by some amount, but each of them are off by one millimeter. The end result is then going to be off by three millimeters because they're all off by one millimeter and they all add to one another. If we have a parallel manipulator, on the other hand, and they all extend and they're all off by one millimeter, the end result is only off by one millimeter rather than the three that the serial robot was off by. So parallel manipulators seem pretty good. However, they have the downside of having a much smaller working space than the serial robots. So they can't move nearly as far given how large the robot itself is. Since JuggleBot doesn't really need a tremendously large workspace and precision and repeatability are critically important, I have made a six degree of freedom parallel manipulator to be JuggleBot's arm. This manipulator is commonly called a Stuart platform if you want to look them up and see what they're all about. But in short, there are six linear actuators that will all extend or compress depending on what I told them to do. And by moving independently of one another, they can control this top platform to move wherever I wanted to in space. Now, in case you're interested, the six degree of freedom refers to the fact that this upper platform, the green part, can move relative to the blue part in six unique directions. And those are translation up and down, translation forwards and back, translation left and right, rotation about one axis, rotation about another axis, and rotation about the third axis. To make it a little bit easier to explain how I've designed this, I'm going to be referring to this top part as the platform and the bottom part as the base. You may notice that it's totally symmetric and so that nomenclature doesn't really matter that much, but it's useful later on and it's just gonna help explain things a bit better. 
To give you a better idea of how this works, I've taken one of the legs off here. So on each end of the linear actuator, I've got a 3D printed ball joint, and those ball joints sit within these holes in the top and the bottom of the, of the Stuart platform. So this can sit nicely in here, and these ball joints mean that the leg can move around in any direction without getting stuck anywhere. To attach the leg onto the platform, I have these little bracket pieces, and these sit over the ball joint and attach into the, either the base or the platform with just a single bolt. This makes it really easy for me to change the design around and to put the legs in different positions and to attach other things onto the platform. If you're curious about how the brackets attach onto the other side of the platform, there's a little groove in there. And in that groove sits a little, I don't know, triangle piece so that I can quickly just fold it in there and snap it on and then put in the screw and it's attached. Easy. To give me plenty of options with where to mount the legs and to attach anything else that I may need to add to the platform later, I've added 60 dimples to the platform and the base, and each dimple has a corresponding hole on the rim. In this way, I can just quickly snap on a little bracket and whatever I need to attach will be attached. I'm honestly super happy with how this design has turned out and it's really really nice being able to just change everything around really quickly and to be able to add anything else on that I need to add on. And this design has certainly come a very far away since my first Stuart platform design which used syringes for the linear actuators and those syringes were driven by just normal NEMA 17 stepper motors with little worm gear uh, drivers and it wasn't fantastic. <laughs> So now that I've got all of these options as to where to mount the legs, where should I put them? Should I orient them all like this, or like this, or like this? Hmm, maybe not that last one. I wasn't satisfied with just randomly guessing a, a layout for all of the legs and hoping for the best. So instead, I wrote a MATLAB script that allows me to simulate for the best leg layout possible. Now, if you have an engineering mind, you might be realizing that there's an issue with what I just said, which is that saying that I want to optimize the platform to be the best is not a very well-defined problem. So instead, I set my aim to be optimizing the workspace of the platform, which is to say that if the base is locked in a specific spot, then I want the platform to be able to reach as large a volume as possible, given that the legs can only extend so far and they can only move so far in their ball joints before they are just physically limited by the way that I've printed them. The way that this script works is that it generates a volume of points and places the base of the steward platform at the bottom of that point cloud. Then it moves the platform of the steward platform point by point to every single location within that cloud and checks whether or not that is a physically possible position for the Stuart platform to be in. The way that it checks that feasibility is against two criteria. And those are that no individual leg is longer or shorter than it can physically be in real life. And the second point is that no individual leg has created a larger angle than is physically possible in the ball joints that I've made. Checking every single point, point by point, it then deems each one as being reachable or not reachable and color codes them so that the reachable ones are green and the non-reachable ones are red. Color coding all of the points like this will generate the curves that you can see now, where on the left, is the original point cloud in red with the reachable points in green. And then on the right, I've just removed all of the non-reachable points to make it a little bit easier to actually see what's going on. 
While it's doing this, the program is also tallying up how many points are reachable as against how many total points there are, allowing me to calculate what I've been referring to as the reach rate, which is the percentage of the total number of points that can actually be reached by the platform. This is all well and good for a single orientation, as it tells me how successful it is at reaching as many points as possible given the layout of the legs. However, I don't want to have to do this manually for every single possible layout of the legs, and there are a lot of them. So instead, what I did is I ran this same simulation 216,000 times, changing the orientation of the legs each time. Those orientations were changing the angle between the legs for the platform and changing the angle between the legs for the base. It might seem like there's more to change on here than that, but as far as the layout of the legs is concerned, if you know what those two angles are and apply symmetry properly, then you have full knowledge of where the legs have to be. There was one other variable that I was not really sure about, however, and that is the ratio of the radius of the platform compared to the radius of the base, which is to say, how big should the platform be compared to the size of the base? Here, they are exactly the same size, but I wasn't sure what would be the best. So to be sure of exactly what ratio of diameters would be ideal, I added this as a variable to my simulation, giving a total of three. Those are the angle of the platform legs, the angle of the base legs, and the ratio of the diameters. Each of these variables was tested over a total of 60 increments, and they were being set, and they were set to change independently of one another, giving the 216,000 simulations that I mentioned before. After each geometry was tested, MATLAB saved what the reach rate for that geometry was, and that has allowed me to generate this plot here. Now, this plot may look a little bit confusing at first, but all that it's showing is on the Z axis up here, we've got the diameter of the base relative to the platform base, where zero means that the base is really small and 3.5 means that the base is really big. And then on the X and Y axes are the two different angles for the base and the platform. What the data is showing is blue and small dots represent a low reach rate and green large dots represents a large reach rate. So we can see pretty conclusively that a relative diameter of one is the optimum diameter for the base and the platform, which is to say that they should be the same size to have the best reach rate possible. And then if we look at the angles, we can see that the optimum angles for the highest reach rate are to have both angles set at 60 degrees. Great, cool. So. We've run the simulation and it's told us what the perfect layout is for the legs to give us the largest reach rate possible, which is to say that this layout of the legs will be able to reach the largest volume out of any orientation for this Stuart platform. So let's make it. Let's see what it looks like. Here we go. I have made it. But unfortunately, as we can see, it is not stable. Not even remotely. It can't hold itself up let alone move in any accurate, predictable way. So what went wrong? I have a simulation that tells us the perfect layout of the legs to give the largest workspace possible, but why is this not a stable design? Why does the whole thing just fall over as soon as a light gust of air blows on it? Well, unfortunately for Stuart platforms and other parallel manipulators, there is a trade-off between stability and range of motion. And I was not aware of this before, and only after building it myself and seeing what happened did I have the light bulb moment of, ah, oh, oops, this isn't going to work properly. To understand why this doesn't work, we have to understand the idea of independence. Now, with the legs laid out the way that they are right now, they are not independent of one another at all. So they all act in the exact same direction. They're all pointing the same way. To make the platform as stable as possible, we need the legs to be as independent of one another as possible. Which, to put another way, means that I want all of the legs to be pointing in a unique direction. 
If this is the case, and all of the legs are independent of one another, then the whole structure will be a lot more stable and much more precise when it's moving around. So let's see what that looks like. So here we go. I've put it all together and we can see that this is a much more stable layout. Even as I shake it around, it still holds its shape really well. Now, because this is so much more precise and rigid and structurally sound than the layout I had before, I'm going to err on this side when I make the design for Juggerbot's actual arm. For now, I'm just going to keep it exactly like this. But at least now after running all these simulations, I know that the further I deviate away from this layout and move towards all the legs being straight up and down, the more workspace I will get, but that will come at a cost of lower structural stability. In case you're interested, I ran the simulation for this layout and for the legs straight up and down layout. And we can see pretty clearly that the legs straight up and down layout has a much higher reach rate of around 8% or so. This design, on the other hand, with the angled legs, only has a reach rate of about 2.2%. So the, having the legs straight up and down allows it to reach approximately four times as much volume. So I'll have to keep that in mind when I actually start to use this on Jugglebot. If I'm running short on space and I need this to move more, I'll straighten up the legs but I'll have to be really conscious of the fact that that's going to lower the structural soundness of this arm. Funnily enough, this layout where all of the legs sort of come to a point and they are asynchronous with one another so that the base's points are where the widest gap is on the platform, this is the exact layout that I used on my very first version of the Stuart platform. And the reason why I picked that layout is because I had no idea what I was doing and I just copied designs that I had seen online. Turns out that those designs were made that way for a pretty good reason. So the geometry is looking pretty good, but there's a pretty big elephant in the room, which is that how do I actually control this? It looks cool and it's nice to play with, but how do I actually get it to move around the way that I want it to? Well, to do this, I've made use of an area of maths called inverse kinematics. I don't want to go into too much detail here because it's a pretty deep topic, but to summarize, if I know where the legs are on the platform with respect to the center of the platform, and I know where the legs attach to on the base with respect to the center of the base, and if I know where the platform is with respect to the base, then I can figure out where all the legs are using a little bit of linear algebra. I don't want to go into more detail than that here. But if you're interested, I'm going to make a follow-up video to this one that goes into a lot more detail on the Stuart platform and how it got to where it is right now on my second channel. So check that out if you're interested. And with that, we have Jogglebot's arm. I am super happy with how this has turned out, and I think it is working perfectly for, how, for what I needed to do. I don't really anticipate needing to change this design much other than making it potentially larger and changing the actuators if these ones aren't fast or strong enough. But for now, it's going really, really well. I can control this with my six degree freedom space mouse to move wherever I want it to in space. And later, this will allow me to program in the path that I need it to follow so that it will move exactly as it needs to. The next step is to put the hand inside this hollow here so that it can then catch and throw the balls as needed. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video and found it interesting. I am really enjoying this process so far, and I hope that you guys can get some enjoyment out of it as well. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Till then.